Hello and welcome to episode 26 of The World Podcast. In this episode, we speak with James Hitchcock, CEO of Radnishal Wildlife Trust. We learn more about the role of the wildlife trusts, the unique Welsh context, and the conception of his dream project, Wilder Pentoyn Farm. Hi, Tom. Hello. Uh, what's the matter with you? Well, it's been a challenging evening, and, and I don't want to go on about it because people that don't have children won't appreciate it, but for the ones that do, our middle child, who's three and a half, as going through a challenging period. And so all I want to do is, is, William, if you are listening back to these at any point, just remind me to talk to you about the evening of the potty, the poo, and the blue nail varnish. I'll leave listeners wondering where all of those things ended up. <laughs> anyway. Safe to say the washing machine is also going on. Yeah. Okay, okay, moving on. This is not a podcast about parenting. This is a podcast about rewilding. And for anyone that's new, as you can tell, Tom and I are married. We have three children and we're busy rewilding our 80 acres in rural Monmouthshire. In this podcast, we cover a range of subjects, including rewilding, nature connection and the importance of community. Yes. And we also, obviously, as part of that, we have our amazing guests that we will speak to later on. We also give a short update on the projects that we're doing. So, Chloe, what's, I mean, there has been lots, but give, give me one that's happened uh, recently. Well, we had a lovely time hosting, and I'm going to have to get this right. I think they're called Subrec, which stands for South East Wales Biodiversity Records something. Wow. Not in marketing then. Well, they may not be good at marketing, but they are very good at insects and identifying stuff. Birds, flora, fauna, they, they were brilliant when yeah. they came. So they came for a, a full day. We were very privileged. They just volunteered their time. These are experts descending on the project where they just go off and you don't see them for the day and or you might bump into them and there'll be somebody getting very excited about the uh what was it the long longhorn bees or the cool moth that basically looks like a twig but isn't and i don't know its name but it's really cool that we've got them on the site yeah it was amazing we had lovely wendy came up late the night before to set up the moth trap and it, early the next morning to see this content and it was amazing. And it was like 30 different moths and micro moths. And people started getting very technical about some of these things and the different, I can't remember what they're called, and the different types or classifications. I got there's some word. But anyway, they were very kind to us both and spent a lot of time explaining what they found, why it was important. And they produced this amazing list of everything that they came across on the project that day. Which there will be a blog post at some point when we get around to it. And it is super important that we get this done as early as possible on the project because we, this is baselining. This is creating that record of knowledge about what we found on a day's worth of hunting, basically, on the, on the land. And this is less than a year into the proper rewilding you know, happening here. So we're hoping this will be a regular occurrence or semi-regular occurrence so we can understand whether we're having a positive or a negative impact and help feed into the understanding of what's happening across Wales or across the UK as well. To that end, we were also joined by the lovely young Wilders who came a couple of weeks ago to help us with our baselining of the habitats. Yes, for context, if people are new to the podcast, we are working with young Wilders and we've put aside about 30 acres of the project. And this organisation specialises in engaging the younger generation, 18 plus though still, that want to get into rewilding. And Young Wilders gives them an opportunity and a platform to connect themselves with landowners like us. And they come in, they do assessments, they create an intervention or a plan for that rewilding project, and then they enact it themselves. So they're building experience and, and fleshing out their CV, all while having a really positive impact on the land. Yeah, and we're really blessed to have Harvey, one of our wild stewards with us, who's been assigned to the project. And he's going to have a critical role in helping us both design the intervention plan and also organise hopefully some amazing volunteer days with groups of young people in the coming months. It's also worth giving a special mention to Ollie and Jack as well. Thank you very much for coming. It was, it was great fun. Right. Um, go on, I think we've got time for one and a half more updates. Shall I start? Go for it. So the half update is the pigs. We've got two pigs on the project. Up until now have been great eye candy. Underachieving. Under, but if I was going to give them a grade at school, yeah, it'd be, you know, D minus for effort and achievement, I suppose. They seem to have mostly been eating the wildflowers has been their main occupation over the last few months. Oh, the irony. However, probably because they heard us talking about it, they have now started rootling, which means they're disturbing the ground and do some serious, some people may see as a damage, but on a rewilding project, this is brilliant stuff. They're exposing bare earth and that's allowing over the next year, birds or other animals to drop and pass by and drop seeds in there, which hopefully will help create a more diverse sward, which therefore will increase, hopefully, the biodiversity on the land, which is the whole point. Go pigs. Go pigs. Well done you, but... Now, up until they were rooting, what they were was very good at entertaining our guests. So here's my segue, Chloe. Okay, I'm ready. 
smooth. You won't notice it, so be careful. We have a community day coming up on the 27th end of this month so literally a few days to sign up and the links will be in the show notes if you do want to sign up to this and don't look at me like that this is a great segue mm-hmm. and listen to the podcast get an opportunity to come meet the pigs for the first time they are very photographed pigs and they do they do take quite a good selfie and they sidle up to you they're not the most wild of rewilding pigs they sidle up to you and then when they get within a meter they just stretch their legs out and then just flop onto their side and wait for a belly rub but either way if you want to come and learn about rewilding, if you want to come and see the project in its early stages, or if, if indeed, if you just want to come and meet the pigs, the community day is an opportunity with anybody with any level of expertise to come and join like-minded people, super relaxed environment. And we, we're going to be part of the big butterfly count. So we're going to be doing butterfly transects. Yep. Jerry's in charge of that bit. Our range Jerry will be in charge of that. And so we can contribute to the wider picture of the butterfly count. We're also going to be continuing to pull out some of the internal fence lines and pretending to be big herbivores going through the land with our flail mower and getting some green hay essentially off the ground where the most diverse foot sward is, so where all the flowers are. And we've got some bare earth areas where we've been doing groundworks. So we're going to spread them there. Now, this has been quite a long top, Chloe, but have we covered most of it? I think so. So that's probably enough about us. And let's get started with the interview with the lovely James, who we've been waiting to get on for quite a while, I think, because he's been one of a select group of people who's been comfortable using the rewilding word in Wales. And I think that's been quite inspirational for us at the start of our journey. Definitely. This interview is all about understanding what role really the Wildlife Trust plays. So it's really a foundational episode that people can understand what they are, why they are across the whole of the UK, how they can get involved and whether or not they are prepared for the future crisis that we're going to face. Hello, James, and welcome to the Wilder Podcast. Good morning. Tor and I have been looking forward to this conversation for a while, I think for two reasons. Firstly, because we love a big picture or strategic discussion. And secondly, because we've been looking at the work of the Radnorshire Wild Up Trust for a while and been so struck, I think, by both the innovative and the creativity that we've been seeing just over the county to us. So, yeah, really excited to get stuck into that conversation. Thank you very much. And, you know, I'm obviously a massive fan of, of you guys and the Grange project too. So thank you very much for inviting me along this morning and looking forward to discussing the work that I've been doing with the team in Radnorshire. I've just realised you are the person responsible for why we now have pigs on the project. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, well, it is. They're great. After a visit to the site, and well, I'm going to go into that ne- uh, l- later on, I'm sure, but after I saw all the good work they were doing and, and chatted to yourself and the team about the impact and the value that they brought, and I came back and said, Chloe, that's it. I think we need pigs. <laughs> yeah, good, good, yeah. They are really excellent disruptors and sort of ecosystem engineers, aren't they? I'm wondering if you could just tell us, say a little bit about how you find yourself the CEO of Randall Wildlife Trust. Um, where to start, really? I suppose just a pretty average guy, really, <laughs> in the scheme of things. Um, developed through childhood a real passion for nature that sort of waned a bit in the teenage years. But, you know, went to university, did a physical geography degree down in the southwest. I was at Plymouth. And it sort of, you know, started to come back. And I was thinking at university, you know, I think I'd like to make a go of trying to work in conservation in the third sector. You know, lecturers were pretty sceptical. It's quite a tough sector in their eyes to get into. So my advice to people is always, you know, don't listen to the detractors, go for it. You know, there's things you can't do. It's a very buoyant market now. Lots of opportunity stuck into some volunteering and go for it. So post-university, where I'd had a lot of fun and perhaps not done quite so much study as one should, I had a year working for the Law Society, which was good, but made me realise that I probably needed to pull my socks up. So I (laughs) saved up and volunteered in my home county of Worcestershire for about 10 months and um, had an absolute ball, you know. I was thinking about it this morning. The first time I was digging a ditch, you know, on a volunteer work party, thought, this is it. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, (laughs) nature conservation. Went off to the RSPB as a little turn warden in North Wales. So that was my big introduction to working in Wales. And then, yeah, I went down to Berkshire, which was a strong contrast, but for one of the biggest wildlife trusts, the Barks Books and Oxen Wildlife Trust, or BBAG, as they're commonly known. And I was an assistant reserves officer there. We ran a team of trainees, had some brilliant heathland sites, owned our own livestock. And yeah, I've moved around from there, really. Came into Radnorshire via Herefordshire and yeah, enjoying my first leadership role. 
Yeah, no, I, hearing you describe yourself as a, as a normal bloke, I mean, that is true on many levels, but having spent time on the project and heard the passion and the outside the box thinking and problem solving approach and intelligent approach to what you're trying to do and visionary, I would probably describe it as well. You would, I'm sure you wouldn't yourself. I generally believe that. I think you're doing great work there. Thank you very much. That's very kind to say, you know, I stick by, I'm pretty average. I have a good team, a lot of support around me. I mean, we're very proud of what we've done at Pentoid and, you know, across our small vice county, actually. Should we go back to the start there? So, I mean, this episode is all about understanding essentially the role of the Wildlife Trust. What is it? And then what are you doing on your, with your, again, federated uh, organisation? And then moving on to kind of the future role that you perceive. But can we go back to start? What is the Wildlife Trust? Yeah. So the, the Wildlife Trusts are a federated group of organizations. So we refer to ourselves as a movement. So the 46 trusts are separate. So we have our own finances, our own governance, but we are bound together by the Wildlife Trust brand and we hold common sort of articles of association and objectives. This is the way to look at it. So we have a UK office and within that there is a Wildlife Trust Wales team and we can't tell them what to do and they can't tell us what to do, but we can agree to work together which we've done and, you know, we are better and better. The Wildlife Trust was really this sort of, was born out of an idea from Charles Rothschild. So like a lot of the established non-governmental organisations or NGOs, you know, National Trusts, we are sort of the creation of landed gentry and the aristocracy. I was thinking about it this morning, how would you express it? You know, the, the work, the creation of the landed gentry and the aristocracy, but a lot of the work was done by the couple next door. <laughs> you know, so for many, many years, you know, the Wildlife Trust were the beach trusts. And, you know, it was very dedicated and passionate people working very hard to conserve pockets of land at local level. And that's where our strengths lie. We have got coverage across the whole UK. Scotland is a trust that cares for a nation, but really other trusts are mostly county level. And then we work closely with the UK office. So nationally, we've got a million members or nearly a million members, about 900,000 at the moment, 39,000 volunteers, 2,600 nature reserves. And the fact that's often pushed out in um, these sorts of discussions is that that gives us more nature reserves than there are branches of McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> that gives you an idea of the coverage. And that means that 60% of the population in the UK live within three miles of a wildlife trust nature reserve. In Wales, there are five wildlife trusts. And in 2022-23, we had a collective income of just over £10 million. And that's expressed through 213 nature reserves, just over 30,000 volunteers and about 4,000 hectares of land. So well over 10,000 acres. And that's, you know, including bucket list sites, I suppose, like Skoma. If you're into wildlife, you know where you can go and walk amongst the puffins, spend the day on the island to newer sites like Wilder Pentoin Farm. And then places like Kemlin Bay, Gilvac Nature Reserve, or smaller sites like Abercamlo Bog. You, know, you can see, you know, wonderful bog flora, peatland flora. These statistics are really impressive. I love the one about the McDonald's. And it often gets cited, I think, that this idea that Britain is a, is a nation of nature lovers. And that's kind of borne out, isn't it, in your membership. But then that contrast between the depletion of nature that we have across across islands. But I, I suppose I wondered, you talked about the Nawalda Trust being an, an NGO. And then you also mentioned the National Trust. And I suppose I was curious about how you coexist alongside the National Trust and alongside other statutory bodies like National Resources Wales or NRW. Yeah, Wildlife Trust, we have a collective strategy with three main goals. And our number one goal is to ensure that 30% of land is managed for nature by 2030. That'll be a goal that's familiar to many who are interested in wildlife conservation because that is an international target that was adopted at COP15 and is born out of the best science, 30% being the level that we need to get land management to, to give us a strong, healthy ecosystem where nature can move around and express itself and we can have natural ecosystems because that's scalable. But it also then gets us to the point where the services, I suppose, if you want to use that terminology, benefit and help underpin the rest of life and the rest of our management elsewhere because you know we've heard a lot about no farmers no food but you know no nature no farmers no food that's how we really need to start thinking about things and nature is often the poor cousin to climate and you know the two are so inextricably linked you know we're really focusing on communicating that and the value of nature and the contribution of land managing land for nature for climate change the second goal is to try and get one in four people taking action for nature, and that's based on the best of social science. 
and that is because one in four is 25 percent and when you get to 25 percent you get to tipping point so instead of being a marginal activity or you know something that's seen as maybe a bit quirky um it becomes mainstream and nature starts being considered in every decision uh, across the side and then our third goal is to achieve net zero by 2030 and to showcase the value of nature and what you might call nature-based solutions in achieving that. So we all work together to achieve those goals and there's lots of detail underneath that, lots of working groups. So how do we interact? NRW National Trust quite different, so good examples. A lot of really good landscape scale work, you know, which is sort of where most people are at now off the back of the Lawton Review, where we realised we needed to sort of have bigger, better and more joined up management for nature. Here's done collaborative. At local level, we talk to the National Trust and, you know, where there are opportunities to communicate and share ideas. We do. Some trusts go as far as perhaps partnering with the National Trust through projects or grants. And then nationally, UK level, you've got groups like Wildlife and Countryside Link, where policy people would get together. And there's a lot of cooperation and sharing, especially for key moments. You know, like when an environment bill comes forward, you know, NGOs are communicating all the time, finding the common ground, working out where they're going to push um, and working out what they're going to say to their members and get people on board. And then, you know, I know the CEOs of the main and the biggest NGOs get together on a, a regular basis. But, you know, National Trust does have some very distinct threads, doesn't it? If we stick with them as the example, they have some distinctly different threads, don't they? They have the big buildings and heritage thread um, where that's not so much our space. So, you know, we don't always have the chance to get involved in, in delivery with them. And then NRW, Natural Resources Wales, they are Welsh Government statutory agency for monitoring, enforcement and support and advice. So they're important. If you take a Gilvach Nature Reserve, that is a site of special scientific interest, so it is protected under the Wildlife and Countryside Act because of its special assemblage of birds and habitats. So we can't, we have to seek permission for certain activities, so we have to go to the protected sites officers to do that, and they say yes, no, or what about. Traditionally, Natural Resources Wales has been a source of funding and advice, but sadly in recent years that funding has been really cut, actually, and you need got got to the point now where sometimes it feels like they've been a bit hollowed out and you know that's a very sad state of affairs to see because government can't do everything and government agencies can't do everything but they do have a huge leadership role and they are the people that have to act or are best placed to act on the legislation and offer advice and enforcement and when people are not allowed to be proactive that is not very um, helpful for furthering big goals and big strategies of which we have plenty in Wales. There are still threads and we obviously we thinking about government and the higher levels of NRW we do engage in advocacy and campaigning where we think things aren't going right and then we try and again share ideas and cooperate but NRW not always very easy to partner with. I would say, because they're a huge organisation with multiple objectives, you know, we're advice county wildlife. I was struck by what you were saying there about the role of advice. And I wonder what function you think the Wildlife Trust have in advising other landowners who might be wanting to encourage nature into their farm or into their garden or into, you know, whatever size of space that they have custodianship over. It is a huge part of what we do because those stats about the number of nature reserves we own and people's access to them are good fun thinking about the fact we've got more nature reserves than branches of McDonald's. But we can't and probably shouldn't buy all the land to get us to 30%. It's much better if we work with other people, people like yourselves, farmers, foresters, smallholders. So actually across the UK, there's over 200 dedicated farm advisors in the Wildlife Trust. And then if you think about Radnorshire as the smallest mainland wildlife trust, for many years it was six staff and they were doing great stuff. Gilvac was done by six staff and a lot of volunteer effort, which we're very grateful for. But we've grown the trust in recent years and we're about, I think, 14 staff at the moment. So, you know, we've got two, three roles working in the office, servicing the day-to-day -day business. Got two people working on the nature reserves. Everyone else is a project officer of some form. So they're out either engaging in communities and helping people in towns and villages or are out working with landowners. 
So, you know, some projects haven't got much in the way of capital, so they can't necessarily offer more than advice, but a couple of their projects, like the Wild and Lug project, has. So we're going out within the River Lug catchment, which is in East Radnorshire, and we are talking to landowners about natural flood management and wetland creation. And we've got a bit of funding to help people do that, and we're, we're getting a lot of interest. Really interesting, again, levels of detail that I've not, not been aware of. I've got two questions before we start focusing in and down into Wales and specifically some of your projects. The first question is just how are or how is the Wildlife Trust funded and how do you, I imagine it's a constant challenge for you and your team to make sure that, that, that things are balancing. So I'd love to know a little bit more about that. And then if we could then move from that into, I'd love to get your perspective on, I know there's two separate questions, but your perspective on the role of the Wildlife Trust moving forward. What role and does it need to adapt or is it actually well suited for the challenges that the future will face? Great questions. So starting with the funding, we have a wide range of funds available to us. So membership is absolutely core to us. In Radbush, we've got quite a high percentage of the population, and which we're very proud of as members. We've got over 1,200 members now at the moment, which is just over 4% of the population. Because I should probably say at some point, for anyone who's not so familiar with the geography of Wales, Radnorshire is a form of Ice County, which actually ceased in 1972 as a distinct local authority. And it is the middle bit of Powys. So Powys is a third of Wales and runs along, you know, the border from sort of Cheshire, Shropshire, Herefordshire to down in, into Gloucestershire. It's very rural, population of about 154,000 people. And Radnorshire, as the middle bit, is actually probably the most rural within that. So we've got about 26,000 people living in Vice County. But nevertheless, membership is hugely important. It's predictable and it's unrestricted. Somebody has got to fund turning the lights on, you know, printing things off and, you know, some of the day-to-day admin. Over and above that, we have government grants for owning land. So we have been able to claim the basic payment scheme and enter into glass tier. We're currently, like all landowners, awaiting more detail on the sustainable farming scheme. It um, has a huge bearing on the future of Wales and how land is managed for nature in particular. And then we have donations. So we run appeals so that the trust spent many years trying to get to a thousand members. I think we we're on about 960 when I was when I started. We've done that. We've exceeded that 1,000 mark, hoping to get to 1,500 if we can in the next year or so. <laughs> so, you know, if anyone's listening and inspired by the work we're doing, do check out our website and do join. Yeah, again, donations, we, we've just been really lucky at how the work we're doing has really captured people and we've been able to receive some very large donations, which we're very grateful for. It's very moving, actually, to receive big sums of money for the work we're doing. But the bulk of what we get is in the form of grant funding, so either lottery or private philanthropy, effectively, so grant foundations, which are either set up by individuals or families. And, you know, that's quite a difficult landscape to navigate. You know, when you start off, you know, some funds only take bits by invitation, so you've got to do a lot of networking. But, yeah, I mean, Hmm. we um, spend a lot of time and effort keeping in touch with our funders, and we have what we call a project pipeline. So we're constantly working on ideas. Based on strategy, you know, and based on what's right for conservation and the people within Radnorshire, but then also like, how do we then take that and package it up into a fundable idea to do positive things that actually deliver meaningful change on the ground? If anyone wants to again find the links to the trust website, that's all going to be in the show notes. Please do have a look. So you mentioned, I think that the trust is 110 years old or, or whatever it was. So it's an old organization. And as I've learned around NGOs and charities, when it's written down and set in stone, it is actually quite hard to change. I don't know, the Articles of Association or the pre-agreement of what, it, what an organization should do. So we've got a very hard decade ahead of us. And a lot of rapid changes, I think, in my opinion, amateur opinion, needs to happen. So what's your take on, is the trust fit for purpose for a strong term, but is it ready to tackle the future challenges? I think that's a really good question. Starting with the last part of that, I think we are very well placed to tackle changes because we sort of have a range of skills. So, you know, the UK team engage in policy and advocacy and can put out the common messages and showcase the best of the work. But then because trusts are organised locally, we are placed to express ourselves locally and address local needs and make sure that nature has got a, you know, attention and support across the UK. The Wildlife Trusts, we engage in community support 
just good old-fashioned engagement, go into schools, work with kids at various key stages. We also own and buy land. Traditionally, we've protected some of the best sites from being destroyed or lost or neglected. And we're organising now to raise further funds and access new forms of funds to buy land that perhaps isn't quite so good and create more space for nature and then broadcast that and encourage other people to do the same. So any business, and you know, charities are a business, you know, and you have to think about what's sufficient. You have to think about, well, we can't do everything, so what are we going to focus on? You know, we have to make sure that we are relevant and that we're listening to people, listening to our members, listening to the public, and that we look exciting to work for so people want to commit their time and their careers to us. And we need to make sure we're looking ahead, making the time to listen to the whispers of the future so we can start conversations around climate adaption and what that looks like for nature conservation management and rewilding. We've seen a lot of changes in the sector and we've seen a lot of new companies come online, a lot of smaller charities formed and that's okay. The challenges are huge and ultimately we need, you know, I always think that what am I really trying to do? I'm trying to get more wildlife. I'm trying to get people to care about it. So effectively, I'm trying to match people's values with action because a lot of people have an interest in nature but don't necessarily think about what they do day to day and how that impacts on nature. So I want to try and close that gap. I really appreciate in a lot of your responses, James, your your kind of central theme is people, the people of Radnorshire and how do we bring people along with us and that answer there about values and how do we help people to take steps towards their values that are in line with those of the Wildlife Trust, I think is a really interesting question. But perhaps before we hear a little bit more about Gilfrack and Pentoyne and which are both sites listed on the Rewilding Britain network, I wonder whether, I suppose both of us have chosen Wales as our home, even though we weren't necessarily born in, in the country. And there's probably something special that's drawn us to here. What are your reflections on working and protecting nature within the Welsh context. I love Wales. It's just, it's got some beautiful landscapes, hasn't it? And my seven-year-old describes Radnorshire as, it's just hill on hill, daddy. <laughs> you know, we don't have mountains. You know, the highest point is 575 metres or 625, so not huge. But when you get onto a hill, you can see other hills and you've got valleys, you've got broadly woodland. And there's a lot of beauty in the landscape. And see, beauty is not always a great proxy for good quality for wildlife. But I think what I would always say about Wales is the baseline is still quite a bit higher you know and the opportunity to for Wales to put its hand up and say we're interested in creating a green economy and a nature-led economy is much higher than some parts of of England so why Wales I don't know really I mean growing up my family we always went to the southwest spent a lot of time in and around Devon family in the navy didn't really start coming to Wales till I was in my teens but you know mountains, rivers, dramatic coastline. It's cut it all, hasn't it? I mean, you know, you can stand in Snowdonia and you can see the coast dunes and then other jagged, ragged, wild-looking mountains. And although there's certainly scope for landscapes to become wilder and once you start to really get into the detail, there's many missing species, there's still some fantastic wildlife there. And that's inspiring. Wales as a country, and I guess we'll come into this a bit more, has it's got a devolved government. It's got a rich culture and a rich history. And it's got some quite progressive legislation and it's made some bold decisions. And I think it just felt like a great place to come and make a life. Do you want to say a bit more about that progressive legislation? Because it actually wasn't something I was necessarily aware of before we moved here. But when I started stepping into that and learning more about it, it really sets a tone for the direction of travel within Wales. In Wales, we've got the Future Generations Act, which is a world-leading piece of policy, I suppose. I mean, it's untested. It's never been challenged in court, but it does set a cultural tone within government down to local authority levels for decisions to be made with the future in mind. I think Wales has made some difficult decisions. I mean, you know, the 20 mile an hour speed limit is a really great policy when you start to think about how to join up impacts and opportunities and costs across government departments. And it has met with incredibly strong opposition from some quarters, but Welsh government have stuck to it because they believe it is the right thing to do. And the Future Generations Act does give that mindset. And I think it is a default government and they are they show that they are prepared to use their powers to do the best for Wales and the future of Wales. There are some challenges around Wales as a standalone economy and the budget as a whole across Wales, but you know, it is trying to make the best it can with what it's got and policy and the delivery of policy and forcing legislation is incredibly powerful. It's not the only form of leadership, but it is a part of setting the right framework for how we organise ourselves. 
So as part of our discovery journey of coming into Wales and hearing about things like the Future Generations Act, we also started hearing some stories about the relationship between Wales and rewilding and some of the history of that. And I wonder whether you could just speak to that for a few minutes. Yeah, rewilding is to me sort of the pinnacle of nature conservation. It's putting nature in the driving seat and allowing natural processes and ecosystems to function so you know you've got predators and prey items and you've got shifting communities of vegetation you know scrub comes and goes and you know you you manage that through large herbivores and in many cases proxies for animals that no longer exist in the landscape so pigs instead of wild boar for instance it's a nice easy example and I think rewilding is a movement that has grown and it's grown in the UK. It's growing worldwide, actually. There's some phenomenal work happening on land and at sea, actually, when you really start to get into the detail. And it's actually been driven, I think, probably in, in the UK by primarily the Nepa state. And the work they've done is so pioneering and has proven that there is a great regenerative economic model there that helps tourism helps create jobs helps diversify land and you know in in a lot of cases is a great form of land management where you have lower grade land so instead of tying yourself into the debt model and the intensive model take your far for gas put nature in the driver's seat turn your land into profitable business again it doesn't necessarily always get universal support and i think that makes people nervous but i think if you're a practitioner or considering being a practitioner i think you should probably just take time to think about is it specifically rewilding as an activity and a process or is it the word which in some cases it could be because some people think rewilding is land abandonment and you know if you're a fifth sixth or seventh generation farmer that's worked hard to get through all of those years of self-sufficiency and boom and bust including famine and you know real hard times you're not going to want to just let things go however rewilding is active management it's just a different form of active management so I think that one for me is quite easy to deal with. But then you've got kickback against change. You know, the change management curve is always sort of denial, anger, acceptance, isn't it? I still think, mm. is it that the right way around or is it denial, anger, anger, denial? <laughs> it's hard. I think we can disagree. Change is hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Wales, is, there is a narrative that rewilding is harder and harder to say out loud. And we were certainly very cautious about using the word as a headline when we bought Pentoin. But we have put Gilvac on the rewilding network. We can come to that in detail at a later point. But effectively, the trust has been rewilding the hill slopes, the upland elements of Gilvac since the early 90s. So, you know, we put the site on the rewilding network. Nothing happened. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wasn't particularly a surprise to people. It was already seen as different. <laughs> you know, people knew that it was a much loved site, you know, drawing a certain amount of visitation to the local town. We involved farmers, you know, we have livestock grazing there. It wasn't seen as a bad thing. The feeling in Wales is that it's more strongly opposed because of a project to summit to see, which happened a long time ago. You know? Well, you know, I think probably if you talk to some of the people involved at the time, mistakes were made, you know, maps were put up with lines around which included people's farms that hadn't been talked to. And, you know, large sums of money were being talked about. And there was a feeling that from some people that things were being imposed on them. And that never goes down well in any form of conservation management or aid project, I suppose, really. Any sort of tried engagement with communities. But the world has moved on, you know. I think a lot of conversation followed that. You know, that project still exists. It's run by the RSPB, Tier Canal. And it's it's doing great stuff. And I think there were probably two or three really strong opponents to Summit to See. And I know at least one of them, from conversations that they've had with colleagues, has been to the net subsequently and said, oh, actually, I get it. I get how that would apply to Wales. So, you know, once the the headline and the the initial kickback has happened, you know, people do come around to it and there is a conversation that can be had. I think rewilding gets accused of lots of things like sort of eco-colonialism you know and Wales does have a different cultural history and it's Celtic the language um, is protected Welsh language is protected and the stronghold is typically the rural and farming community so I think what I would say is that rewilding shouldn't threaten that it might change it we are at a point now as Tom said where the next 10 years sees us facing some huge challenges where we need cross-sector multi-party efforts to change the way we manage land and change the way we think about what productive land is and adapt for the future. And I don't think there's a silver bullet. We've got to have a whole spread of stuff. If you, I mean, you know, think about the 30 by 30 target. 30% of Wales is 1.5 million acres. 
there's definitely the space for it. And if people can make a good living out of it, get the right sorts of payments from various sources, I think they'll do it. And, you know, Rewild in Britain, who've really led a sort of push to get Rewild in within the mainstream, they want 5% of the 30% as rewilding sites, mostly in the form of core rewilding areas, as I understand it. So you'll have parts of Northern England, I think, are making quite good strides where you might bring back certain lost keystone species and you might have many thousands of acres or even hectares under very extensive management. And then that feeds out into wider landscapes where you've got regenerative farming happening and or conventional nature conservation. It becomes far more than the sum of its parts, incredibly resilient and probably, I would expect, very regenerative, you know, much stronger, more vibrant rural economy as a result. Yeah, it's really exciting to think about some of that potential. And in terms of exciting projects, Wild of Pentoin is a flagship project for Renaissance and, and for some of the wildlife trusts. And I think we should do a whole episode on the project as a whole, maybe next year. Where I know Chloe, who's been to visit our site and who's the project officer there, as we have to share us some more detail of what's been happening and some of the things they've noticed in the rewilding process. But I suppose whether you could speak briefly to the strategic context of deciding to progress with Wilder Pentoin, how it was funded, and some of the hopes of what that would mean for the Wildlife Trust. Well, the Pentoid Farm, I mean, a dream project in many ways, and a sort of culmination of a lot of the best of modern conservation thinking and, and you know, my personal experience. But it was a big decision. Although, of it in itself, 164 acres, that's not the biggest piece of land that Radnisher owns. Gilvac Nature Reserve is over 400 acres, much bigger, but came into a trust, you know, that was trying to get to a thousand members, was running appeals every other year and had done a lot on its own land and a lot with sites that were already very good for wildlife. And this farm came up at a time when there was a wildlife trust-wide conversation about levelling up, we can use that term, and giving each trust equal opportunity to access bold opportunity. So this farm, Pentoin, is immediately next to 200-acre common, which we'd owned since um, the 2000s, Knuck Bank. And that, in turn, is part of a wider common owned by the Crown Estate called Beacon Hill, which is 5,000 acres. And commoners there work pretty collaboratively together, and there's some pretty good management for nature going on up there. So Pentoline was a pretty standard farm for mid you know, sheep and beef. It was on the market on closed tender. I thought, oh, no, that looks exciting. <laughs> that's, that's very strategically placed from a wildlife trust point of view and from a nature creation point of view. Can we make a move to buy that? So sort of emailed a few colleagues and they said, yeah, you know, we've got some ideas, we'll support you. And they introduced me to Julia Davis, who is a real force of nature. And, you know, she came out and, and visited us. She got out of the car and she said, you know, you're a small wildlife trust. You need a small project. Don't want to be too ambitious. And we walked around the land. And would you agree that with the agents? It was on the market. We talked and we found lots in common, lots in common about vision and about how we could use a relatively small average farm to start a bigger conversation and to attract lots of support. And then, you know, at the end of it, they've put, said, yeah, you know, I'll lend you the money to do this. You know, you know we've got to do it. We've got to go for it. So right. then, big decision by board, trustee are brave to make that decision because trustees are volunteers but they are the legal directors and they carry the can so my thinking my business plan was effectively now is the moment to do this now is the moment to effectively create a world rewarding project with a strong vision and if that idea is good enough we would attract funding and support from across the uk that took a little bit of time to settle in but we did it we got there you know we, we bought the site <laughs> and then that's where the real work starts. So we spent the first year creating a vision and raising funds. You know, and I was able to get support from a colleague who was working in the Central Wildlife Trust team, James Byrne. And we just really worked around the clock raising funds for that site while creating that 30-year vision, which people can see on our website. About a month after purchasing the site, we invited the locals uh, or a good portion of the local community to site. So we think we invited about 55 people and had about 40 we gathered in the barn and I stood on a hay bale and some people had beer, tea and buns, and whatever. We took questions about the site. So progress was pretty slow to start with, but then we sort of gained momentum. And you know, we got in specific member of staff, Chloe, who's brilliant and delivering the project on the yearly habitat restoration. And we created a new role, a head of conservation. 
who's helped come in and support the team to get the grazing organized on site. And we've built relationships with two local farmers who've got the stock on site. We've leased the bungalow, which we got a couple along with seven acres of land and setting up a market gardening business. We had to make a difficult decision to sell the main farmhouse because it was in need of a lot of care and attention and we felt like it would soak up too much of our resource to invest in it for not enough gain. But we're very pleased that a local couple have bought that and they're actively engaged in restoring it and gives a real sense that there's people living on site still and, you know, still farm in that sense. And it's going from strength to strength and we've used it then to create a wilder lug project. So the river lug rises about half a kilometre above Pentoyne and flows around the boundary of it. And then we're in conversation with the Crown Estate about working collaboratively and via a contract or a project to support the commoners on Beacon Hill to undertake more management for nature. So that'll be in the form of creating leaky dams, open water, maybe doing some peat restoration, although there's not huge amounts there, and maybe doing some strategic tree planting to create more freeze or wood pasture upon the hill. The passion that was coming off of you then is fascinating. And one of the things, having been there, is your integration with the local community, local farmers, working hand in glove with those guys and girls Bring them along the journey, I think, has been crucial to the success and the integration of what you've been doing. So we are coming, sadly, to the end of this. Thank you very much for your time. What we often do is come back to our guests and say, is there anything that's been kind of left unsaid or is there anything you really want to highlight before we close out the podcast, James? Well, th- thanks, Tom, and thanks, Clary. It's really enjoyed talking to you today. Time's gone really quickly, and I think trying to pull everything together, I think what I would say is, Business as usual from this point onwards is is not an option. Wales faces many challenges, as does the rest of the UK. But Wales has a bigger funding gap. Government cannot solve this. So we need to draw in more funding from sources like business and individuals and grant foundations. I think people are listening to this because they're interested in rewilding or even nature-friendly farming. Get in touch with one or either of us or other organisations like TNHU and Rewild in Britain because there are people out there doing great stuff in Wales and, you know, share what you're doing and let's create the sense that there's a real movement of change. And I think let's take the spirit of the Future Generations Act and think about what it would mean to be good ancestors. What are cultural landscapes for the future? And what are resilient landscapes for future generations? I would say that if we can go with rewilding, go with nature conservation at landscape scale, we will have vibrant landscapes, abundant nature and prosperous people. What a thought to close on. Thank you very much. I'm already looking forward to getting Chloe uh, on the podcast to really expand on that project because it is quite fascinating what they're doing. I'm ashamed we didn't get enough time to dig into that. One of the points that I thought was interesting from that chat was the point James made about being a good ancestor. And I just wonder what stage people start thinking about what legacy they're going to leave behind. And obviously for us, some people might say we were quite late to the party, for lack of a better term. Uh, you know, that happened to us five and a half years ago, the birth of our first child. And it wasn't necessarily being an ancestor to the country. It was an ancestor to our children. It's what are we going to leave our children and what state are things going to be? So then my question is, is do we need to have children to start caring about it? And what percentage of the population innately care? Because there are definitely people that innately care about the future of the world from a young age. I'd be interested to understand the current balance and whether that's being affected by people having fewer or no children as well. Quite a deep question for you, Chloe. It's quite a deep question for after nine o'clock on a Thursday evening. But I think it's an interesting one because I agree with you. I think there are some people that have either a deep innate connection to nature and for them that is a driving force in all of their thinking. Or there are people that have a deep concern about social justice and the impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss on a global scale. But I think there are also people that perhaps need it a bit more in your face like we did. Like seeing that little person and thinking, what are they going to say to us? So maybe that's quite a selfish reason you can uh, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think I wouldn't shy away from that. I think that's to assume, say everyone should be more altruistic is just not a reality. So I think we've got to start understanding what motivates people to change. And I guess from an evolutionary psychology perspective, you would say that we have this deep desire to preserve the quality of life for our children. So then that would make sense within that context. 
But that's interesting about people having less children because actually that's sometimes a decision that's motivated by people that are concerned about climate and what world their children are going to come into and the, the impact of having a child in terms of the carbon footprint and the extractive nature of economic system, which means that to exist, you have to extract generally. Although I will say, because we have a friend of ours who asked me that same question, I would always say that the fact you're asking that question for anyone that's listening and thinking the same thing would suggest that maybe that child would be brought up in a way that who understands and appreciates and respects nature. We need more of those children who get that. So please don't, you know, I think be put off by the threats and challenges associated with the world. There's always been strife in the world. We just got to bring our children up to be resilient and to be respectful. I think going back to the idea of good ancestors, one of the books I've been reading talks about, I guess, an intervention or an idea, which is essentially you would write a letter to, I think they talk about the seventh generation after yourself, which is quite a long way. I'm not sure my brain can deal with that. I guess the technique is a way, isn't it, of helping people to conceptualise. When we live in such a short-termist system of, you know, within a government system is what sometimes it's just four to five year cycles, really trying to imagine actually those ancestral roots go back generations and they will go forward generations. And to be good ancestors, we really need to be thinking about that. Some of the small decisions we make now can have massive implications for the future. There's some sort of quote about someone planting a seed that makes shade for the next generation, but I but I can't think of it. So, Well, I, it's interesting you say that because I think when we walk around the project here and we see some of the oak trees that are 300 plus years old, which is about seven generations probably, mm, maybe even more than that. Not. Yeah, yeah. You do really think about what was that life like when that little oak tree was a acorn? little sapling now what is it going to see over the next 200 300 years it's quite grounding in that sense definitely well it's gone pretty heavy and pretty deep towards the end of this so yeah i think we should uh quit while we're ahead uh, if you've enjoyed the podcast please do take the time to rate and review it makes a huge difference do not forget after all this deep conversation that there is a community day coming up and that's all going to be in the show notes and until the next episode i hope everyone has a good couple of weeks 